breaking up is not enough. Flourishing in the Human Space, a podcast by Polly Young Eisendraff and Michael Berger. When you peek into the cosmic unity of existence and feel the love and inspiration of awakening, what happens next? Whether it's through meditation, spiritual practice, near-death experience, ingesting a mind-altering substance, or being born again, you don't get a map for improving your messy life. In this podcast, Holly Young Eisendraff and Michael Berger draw on expertise in science, psychology, adult development, psychedelics, NDEs, dreams, and Buddhist practice in conversations about compassion, resilience, responsibility, kindness, and development after awakening. You will learn how to chart a new path for flourishing in the human space in which waking up is important, but not enough, and growing up is never finished. Co-hosts Polly Young Eisendraff and Michael Berger bring different kinds of expertise. Polly is an author, psychologist, Jungian analyst, longtime Zen practitioner, couple therapist, and founder of Dialogue Therapy and Real Dialogue. Michael Berger is an entrepreneur, an expert in psychedelics, a spiritual practitioner of Jewishness, a skeptic, a Real Dialogue specialist, and a filmmaker who is known for his documentary, Improbable Collapse, The Demolition of Our Republic. Polly and Mike will engage with each other and invite a wide array of guests who are accomplished scientists and seekers whose work lies beyond the hegemony of materialism. What causes the transition away from conformity? What is known about stages after conformity? At the later stages of ego development, people naturally encounter self-evaluated standards in place of group norms and begin to feel intensive responsibility for their own achievements, self-respect, and creative fulfillment. The emerging sense of self-awareness signals the end of true conformity and the start of non-conformity. These shifts take place in a largely non-conscious way and are mostly unsupported by mainstream society or culture. In this podcast, Mike and Polly talk about these and other paradoxes involving post-conformist adult development that can be mistaken as uncaring or even off the wall. At the highest stages of ego development, individuals often experience alienation and non-witnessing because there are few others who embrace the full wisdom of human awareness at later stages of development. Well, this is a big piece to bite off and chew because we're going to talk about the beginning of nonconformity through self-awareness. And then we hope to travel all the way to the end of this continuum of ego development stages, or let's say stages of adult development. We could consider these to be paradigms of adult development, development kind of as we pointed out a couple of episodes ago, nested paradigms. Each one reorganizes the last one into a new one. And all of the paradigms that have come before are potential organizations of one's experience. So all of us can go backwards to being essentially, you know, impulsive, even pre-social in our enactments and experiences, but we can't go forward beyond the paradigm that we're in. So each new organization is essentially a new map, a new lens, a new way of seeing things, and it can't be transcended until the next organization begins. So just kind of keeping all that in mind, because we spoke at length last time about conformity and the enormous power of conformity, that, you know, that is essentially the stage at which people are willing to accept authoritarian personalities as leaders 
it's the stage at which people are willing to give up their, let's say, freedoms, you know, like freedom of speech or, or freedom of thinking even, in favor of a rules-based order within a group. In other words, the conformity to the group, the sense of belonging to the group, the sense of security in a group, and the group could be here, any group, it can be a non-conformist group, it can be a family, it can be a peer group, but it's this experience that belonging to the group is the ultimate freedom. It is the ultimate safety. It is the ultimate security. So you have to sacrifice in order to carry out the rules of the group. And that's what we were talking about last time. And you were citing a book about Nazism that came out right after World War II, what's known as World War II, which talked about some of these qualities of the conformist. So I, I want to just remind people of that because we're moving beyond conformity and that shift away from conformity is not obvious to people. You know, it's not simply becoming a nonconformist. And many people say, you know, well, I'm not a conformist and I don't go with the flow. But that's very confusing because you can be a nonconformist, not go with the flow because you're impulsive, because you're self-protective, because you are a conformist, instead of actually being a non-conformist, because the shift is in the logic, the underlying assumption or reasoning that that individual is using to think and feel about being a member of a group. So I just want, want to start with that before we actually get into the weeds of, of self-awareness and how that moves into deeper states of nonconformity. Yes. I, I also just wanted to point to a paradox that that at the conformist stage is also in conforming to the nonconformist view. And without the awareness that we're going to begin discussing at this stage. So I'm identifying with an out group and then I take on and conform to the values of the out group that defines themselves in contrast to some other group, and yet it's still a group of conformists. They're just conforming counter to the in-group that may be larger than theirs, but it's still based on conforming. Right. And and maybe even the in-group that that individual just belonged to recently, it doesn't necessarily have to be larger, you know, the in-group. I mean, often the real in-groups are larger, but it's again the reason why I, you know, linger on this is that it's so not intuitive for people. It's just not intuitive to realize that the shift away from conformity is not the shift into nonconformity. It's not saying, you know, well, I'm not a, I'm not going to conform to this. It's 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 the shift into self awareness, and that's what we're going to talk about. But again, it's very confusing because you see yourself as a nonconformist. You see yourself as going against whatever you think is the mainstream, which is what you think is the mainstream, you know, because you don't know anything except what you know. And so then you want to go against that mainstream. And actually, you've just repeated the logic of conformity because you simply believe in your own group. And you simply adhere to the rules of your group and you keep on carrying out those rules. And so, you know, it doesn't matter if you are, you know, emo, a conspiracy theorist, a normie, a flatlander, whatever. If you are conforming to your group, you are a conformist, particularly if you value that conformity and believe it's truer than individual differences. Uh, that's one way to test yourself, you know. And so it means that you that you believe, again, in your paradigm, people need to be sorted out by their groups, by their tribes, by their nations, their cultures, their families, their status, whatever it is. It's a group sorting. And that, uh, you know, I, I think about if I, I'm in a social, at a social event or at a cocktail party, what are the kinds of questions people ask to make small talk? Well, one of the, one of the in-group 
non-starters is how much do you make a year? However, probably one of the more common questions is what do you do? So it's right. acceptable to define yourself by the role. So if you're a nonconformist, if you've moved beyond the conformist stage, how people hear that answer to that question becomes really intriguing. Even how you answer that question becomes really interesting because it also gives you a little bit of feedback on the person asking the question, depending on what your answer is. If you're living out of a post-conformist reality where, you know, and I think this is, this is where we're going to go into the weeds about the dramatic shift in our perceptions about how I perceive myself, how I perceive others. And at a deeper level, it's, it seems to me, one of the, the deeper questions to raise is how our decision-making changes as we go through these stages. Our moral compass changes, our character changes, our uh, cognitive abilities change, our emotional abilities change, and of course, our decision-making changes. You know, when you were saying this, I, and I may have even said this in an earlier podcast, but I taught at Bryn Mawr College for 10 years altogether. I was on a tenure track position and I left after the tenure was positively reviewed and I got tenure, but I didn't stay and take tenure. I often was asked the question at the cocktail parties then, because I don't go to any anymore. So it was way back then. Uh, people would say, so where did you go to undergraduate school? Or they sometimes would just say, what was your college? Now, I went to Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, which was a, the first land-grant university in the West when it came into being. It's, it was a liberal arts college. It was not Ohio State College, but it was not by any means an elite Ivy League college. Typically, people teaching at Bryn Mawr College went to one of the Seven Sisters. They went to an Ivy League or at least a baby Ivy and so when people would say, so where did you go to college? I'd say Ohio University really slowly because I wanted them to hear it wasn't Ohio State University, but they would immediately say, oh, that's the place that has the big football team, you know, and I would say no. And I realized the question was a sorting. We, they were going to sort me out. They were sorting me into Wellesley, Radcliffe you know, Holyoke, uh, Vassar, that would have been a lower sort. They hadn't even, they didn't even have a rating for Ohio University. Now, I did my PhD at Washington University. They would have had a rating for that had that been my undergraduate college. But the undergraduate indicated my social status. And so I had to learn to read all of this code to get past that moment when that question was inevitably asked, because as people were getting to know me, they wanted to know where to slot me in. Um, and the only way I could get past the question was to make a joke. I would say, don't worry, I'm literate. I'm literate, <laughs> even though I went to Ohio University. Um, and that is the kind of conformity in an unconforming environment. Supposedly, you know, I'm in an elite college where they're not conforming. But the conforming that was going on was to status. And the codes were hard to read, but the feelings were easy to read. You could read the person was going to dismiss you because you were not in the status group. So again, that's a really good, I feel, example of conforming to nonconformity. Yes, and I have to share this because it's along the same lines, but there's a little quirk quirkiness about people who've grown up in St. Louis where people who grew up here when they meet you at a party or one of the first questions they ask here to do the same sort of sorting is where did you go to high school and so it's traveling comedians who come through St. Louis tend to make note of this because I don't know that there are other cities where people 30 years out of high school want to know where you went to high school because all of the assumptions are you've grown up here, you've stayed here, you've stayed close to where you grew up, and the high school that you went to allows them to put you in a box on status, education, values, or perceived values. So it's interesting that there's kind of a, there's a small townishness to St. Louis that is all about conformity. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, that and that may be true of other cities, but probably not based on high school. Typically, it's interesting because we'll go into environments that we regard as elite or sophisticated, like being faculty at Bryn Mawr College. I regarded it as very sophisticated when I first arrived there. Over time, I reevaluated everything. But, you know, at the time I thought, well, people here are going to be welcoming a lot of divergent thinking and diversity and points of view. And, you know, they're going to want to collaborate on doing research together and they're going to be inclusive of the younger people because I was a younger person then. And none of those things were true at all. And almost everything was sorted out by social status. After I got that memo, I just stopped trying. But at the beginning, I was trying. So I think, you know, again, I want to I want to emphasize the self-awareness that's involved. And I can say that by the time I went to teach at Bryn Mawr, I had acute self-awareness about my own nonconformity. I was at this point, I had worked with Jane Lovinger for I think four or five years, and then I was setting up, one reason I got hired there was to set up the Ego Development Project at Bryn Mawr, where we would do research uh, in the doctoral program there. So um, I was aware from working with Jane that I had scored at the highest level of ego development in taking the sentence completion test for ego development in her first seminar, which I took when I was doing my master's degree. So I started out doing a master's degree in social work at Washington University because I wanted to be a therapist and I didn't want to go for a doctorate in psychology. And I somehow happened on to her seminar in ego development, which was in the psychology department. And I took that seminar. And in that seminar, she had us all do a sentence completion test. And then you know, some months after we did the test, and I believe it was a one semester, although it might have been a two semester of course, I'm not sure. I just remember walking across the campus. I remember it was spring. Dr. Lovinger came up to me and said, uh, you know, Miss Young or whatever she called me, Miss Eisendrath, I don't know. What, you know, what do you do? Like, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, like, what, what kind of thing are you doing? And I said, well, I'm doing a master's degree and you know, I have children and I didn't know which kind of answer she wanted. And then she said, would you like to come and work for me? And of course, I mean, I thought she was God, you know, it's like God says, would you like to come and work for me? You go, well, I would do that for free. You know, I, I would do anything for you. So I said, of course. And she said, you know, I want you to come over to the Institute, the Institute for Social Science is what it was called and, you know, meet the people. And, and this summer I'll start to train you. So of course I applied for, if she said you should apply for your PhD. You know, you, you shouldn't just get a master's degree. Okay. She says, apply for the PhD. I apply for the PhD. But um, later I realized that she selected the people to be on her team who scored at this high level because to score the sentence completion test, you can use the manual and the answers are all there up to the highest stages. So the stages that are called stage five and stage six of the post-conformist stages, and we will talk about those today, they require discussion among people who know how to reason from those highest levels. So you can see, because if you didn't have that logic yourself, you couldn't score the actual protocols for the test. And of course, I knew none of that at the time. I had no idea of why she chose me. It was really only looking back over this years later did I realize of course, that was what she did. She gave this sentence completion test. Then she chose the people that were at the highest level to come and work for her. But then she did direct our dissertations too. I mean, so it was great to be there, she, but she was an incredible taskmaster. And a lot of people didn't finish their dissertations because she was so tough. You know, at the by the time I arrived at Bryn Mawr, I could read the tea leaves. I knew what was going on. And so it did preserve my self-esteem. I wasn't intimidated by the people who said, you know, where did you go to undergraduate college? I basically thought, wow, there's a lot of conformists here. And so, you know, there's there's a way that being at a later nonconformist stage can give you confidence about what people are doing with you. On the other hand, I knew there was no way I could really talk about this with the colleagues who had been asking the questions. And then more and more. I began to see that a lot was organized around status at an elite college, 
surprise, you know, but I didn't realize it would be in the faculty so heavily. Well, this is after you had worked with Dr. Levenger. Yeah. And so you were in, in a way, in a bubble, in yeah. a post-conformist bubble, and then you go out into the world and you go, this isn't the norm? Well, like there's you know, this dawning awareness as was, you're relating, yeah. right? Well, it was the elite world. I mean, so to be fair, I, you know, I did believe I was entering into essentially like the God realm at Bryn Mawr. I, it was a school that I had admired because of women's intellectual development. I also didn't, when I interviewed for the job, I didn't think I'd get the job. I mean, there were just many things that led me to feel like I've arrived. I have arrived now in this environment that's going to be a complex intellectual environment for women's development. And I assumed that people on the faculty had achieved these higher levels of development. I've, I've you know, in a, in a naive way, I didn't think across the board, but I thought larger numbers than in the typical population would be at these complex stages. And what I found was, hmm, not so much. I mean, in certain select groups, like I belong to a group of, it was called a, the Group for Criticism and Interpretation, and it was philosophers from Bryn Mawr, Swarthmore, and Haverford, and they let me in, and then they they made me take LSD, as I mentioned in another episode. They made you? Well, they, they made me. They said, everybody in the group has taken LSD, and, you, you, and I said, look, I'm a Zen practitioner, blah, blah, blah. Well, we would just like you to take it. So I did. It's my only time taking LSD. And, uh, you know, it was well, based on what you've just described. You were set up to not really have a good experience. If somebody's well, telling you that you must do something and it's not uh, optional and it's not it kind of goes back to the distinction between an NDE that happens to you. In yeah. essence, an LSD trip happened to you. <laughs> it was a setup, you know. I mean, I understood it. Again, retrospectively, I understood the whole thing. Also, that group of people was complex. That was a very complex group of people. That was not the people at the cocktail party. So I very much appreciated the knowledge I gained, the philosophers I met, the inquiries that we made. They were They were complex. They were deep. I felt like this was a way that, I don't know. They wanted to, I'm not sure if it would be test me or or just see what I thought. I mean, really what did happen was not different than what would happen at an intensive Zen retreat, but it was just very mm, concentrated or provoked. I mean, it was it was a it was as though I was, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, I sometimes do, but I might have mentioned this in an earlier episode that it was a little bit like an induced childbirth. Like everything happened fast. I recognized the states of mind that I was being essentially pushed into by the drug, and they were not at all unfamiliar from experiences in Zen meditation, but there was an aspect of the whole experience that was psychotic, and I typically would not have that experience in a, a meditational setting, although I touch on it from time to time. But what, what I did have through the whole experience was what I also had in childbirth from the Zen training, I had awareness. I had that awareness of my awareness. I could track what was going on. I could think about what was going on. Uh, so I wasn't totally swept up into it. I was basically tracking it. And it is this thing called self-awareness that allows us to move out of conformity. And by that time, I had strengthened my muscle of self-awareness so much by the time I took LSD, which was, I was like 36 or seven, I don't know, that I knew I could, I could be aware of my awareness, even when I was on the drug. It was harder in the childbirth process because I fainted periodically and I was not aware when I was deeply unconscious. There are, by the way, masters who are aware even when they faint. So, you know, that, I don't want to diverge too much here, but that sense of being in an environment where people are conformists and you assume that you're going to be in a more complex environment, um, it's hard even if you know what's going on. And then it was a great relief to get into this group. I got into a couple of special groups, one a seminar on epistemology, psychotherapy, and development. 
And then this other one, this, this group, it's, it was called a Committee on um, Interpretation and Criticism. And in both groups, what was being examined was the structure of consciousness, the th very thing we're talking about, the way that development works. And yet you've just embodied and brought up the first paradox, uh, the expectation that maybe intelligence or other personality characteristics are correlated to stage development, and there isn't really a correlation. There's no direct correlation between an IQ and stages of development. I, I have found that challenging and paradoxical. I've made certain assumptions as I've become more aware, and I've found them to be quite wrong, false right. assumptions. I, so I, I mean, think that's, that's, that's this first kind of paradox about development. And that it's about the quality of your awareness of your awareness. Yes. It's that beginning to question your own, my own assumptions. And in a way, it's a winnowing. If I'm going to begin to, to, to go into this maybe a little bit more deeply, right? From my own experience, it's about winnowing everything I've absorbed from my culture that I've taken on as myself or as part of my identity and beginning to evaluate by my own standards, according to my own beliefs, my own values, trying to discover my authentic desires that aren't absorbed from the group that may or may not be in alignment with what other people value or desire and the willingness to embody that. And at the same time, not have a peer group to almost be a you know a lone wolf but to go it alone because it's very difficult to find people to share some of these perspectives with from this post conformist development stage right well and to be fair or to be clear statistically speaking there is correlation between IQ and ego development up about through the self-aware stage, then it stops being correlated. In other words, this is a very good, like Jane was very, very pleased that there was this kind of correlation because it you would expect in moving from impulsive to self-protective to conformist to self-aware that people would be getting more intelligent. And then those two, two processes or, or two streams apart from each other. So there's there's a correlation up to a certain point, and then there's a divergence. And there is a term for this statistical term, I don't remember it, but it's it's exactly what you would want to see in a system like ego development that does base itself on increasing complexity. So, you know, is that complexity just intellectual complexity? No, it is not. It's, it's emotional, moral. Um, and so, Right where we are now at the self-aware stage is where IQ and ego development part ways, so to speak, in terms of correlations. So um, everything you're saying about the self-aware stage is correct. And I, I want to just read a few um, just quick kind of labels for, so self-awareness comes out of the conformity stage as a new kind of self-consciousness and rudimentary self-awareness and self-criticism is the special characteristic of it, that people become self-critical. And also, um, they have a stronger awareness of individual differences in attitudes and interests and abilities. But still, those, those categories are still fairly banal or banal and global. Self-consciousness is often acute particularly in teenagers who are moving into the self-awareness, they uh, see themselves as uh, extremely different from other people. And uh, they assume in some ways that there's never been anyone on earth like them. That is really, you could say, the onset of self-awareness. It's like a, it's coming in as a sensitivity, just like almost if you were allergic to something, you know, like suddenly you feel like you've really got a bad case of this and that other people aren't like you, and that everybody's looking at you, and that you're not like anyone who's ever lived on earth. So how are you going to figure out, you know, how to live? 
So when in the onset of self-awareness, there's usually acute self-consciousness, even if it occurs later in life, um, not the teenage years. And so there's also this, this sense of inner conflict. And that's the thing that really distinguishes self-awareness from conformity. You see multiple possibilities and alternatives and different situations. You begin to see exceptions and comparisons. Again, these are more global and banal than at later stages. But there's the recognition of contradiction in yourself. There's a recognition that, well, for example, you might say, well, honestly, there's a moment like this in the Barbie movie. And so I'm just going to mention it. This movie that that is popular right now, they're, the Barbies are having their disco night and everything's great and every day is great and everything is wonderful and they're all wonderful and they all love each other and everything's perfect. And out of nowhere, the stereotypical Barbie says, well, what about death? And all the music stops. And so, every, everyone so just stops. Spoiler, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, I suppose the spoiler alert. There's a lot more to the movie. And, I mean, but I, I that's, love that's, that scene. I saw it in a packed theater in the city at 8.30 at night. And as soon as the stereotypical Barbie says, have any of you ever thought of death? Yeah. You could hear a pin drop in the theater. The audience did not see that coming at all. It was really magical, actually. Right, right. And so that's that's the kind of moment that people experience when they're all about conformity and then suddenly they have an individual thought and and nobody responds to her. They just they just say, let's get back to the music. Oh, she says, oh, that was silly. Why did I say that? So that is a very, very good example of how this growing self-awareness starts. So yeah. that aspect of it is this ability to reflect on your own awareness and hear your own thoughts that contradict or go against what you've been conforming to. It's as if you've I've suppressed what I'm not allowed to think. You know, in a way, it goes back to, and they thought they were free. Over time, by not resisting, you take on the beliefs and the values of the wider culture. And in our culture, you know, it's kind of like asking somebody how much they make. You don't ever hear somebody at a party go, so what do you think happens after you die? Right. <laughs> do right. you think about death? What are your thoughts on death? So again, you know, it's it's not, it, it may not be the larger culture, because in Barbie land, that's a special culture, Right. And Barbie Land's kind of in their own bubble, but they're kind of they're kind of in a very good place. They're outside of the norm. But as soon as you go against Barbie Land, everything stops. And so, you know, you can be in your in your subculture of flatlanders and everything's fine because you all kind of believe the same thing. But then you suddenly say, well, but what about this? And nobody says anything. And that's the beginning of a new development for that individual. If they can't stop asking those questions, they will start to wake up to the next stage of development. And so another aspect when you brought up the uh, teenager becoming more self-aware, another characteristic of that teenager is they know it all. You can't tell them anything. They actually know it all. And so part of this ability to look at your own awareness involves becoming aware that you actually may not know it all and there's more to learn and the world's much larger than you've ever imagined it to be and it's way more complicated and by raising this to conscious awareness becoming aware of my own internal unresolved conflicts of dilemmas etc it can lead to transcending that sense that i'm everything that i know it all right right and so sometimes again you know waking up through meditation, near-death experience, taking a substance, that kind of waking up can wake you up from conformity. And so it can be that if you if you are a conformist, that kind of waking up can wake you up. You know, sometimes a religious experience, again, in the uh, we're talking about waking up from conformity, not waking up at higher levels of non-conformity, but just that awakening, like the thing in the Barbie movie, where or the teenager you know suddenly still feels themselves to be really different from others that stops the conformist support when you start to say things that go against the group and like in the barbie movie you have to go out there and repair the tear in the fabric 
And if you're in a very strong group and you start a very strong, I mean, persuasive or compelling group mind of whatever it is, if it's a cult or if it's a peer group or it's a political group or, or you know, like the 9-11 thing, if you tear the fabric of conformity, uh, people want you to repair it quickly. And if you can't repair it, then you have to move on. So, you know, one of the developmental reasons researchers from the past who was a friend of Jane Lavender. His name is Jack Block. He did a particular method of statistical analysis, but he used this phrase that comes from Piaget's ideas. He, he would say, assimilate when you can. In other words, try to keep yourself in the framework that you're in, but accommodate when you must. So that once your mind changes to the degree that you can no longer assimilate to the group format, then you have to accommodate to a new way of thinking and you have to leave the group. And so really the first leaving of the group is usually when you break through conformity and you then you leave the group that you thought you belonged to and it's painful, but you begin to become an individual and you begin to notice the contradictions in yourself. If you remain at this self-aware stage, which is the majority of America, you still have a strong belief in conformity. You, you have a general sense like, yes, there are individuals. And yes, in every group, there's a variety of individuals, but mostly the important differences are group differences, you know, like Republicans and Democrats or people that believe in vaccine mandates and people who don't believe in vaccine mandates or people who uh, agree that marijuana is good for you and people who don't. So that, that sense still is that most important differences are group differences, but we know within those groups are individuals. And also the sense of feelings, like you're sort of happy, you know, happy, sad, glad, and mad. I mean, they're very sort of basic and banal. And also the the general way of thinking about differences is still very concrete. Like you think that way because you're Jewish. Or you think that way because you grew up in Akron, or you think that, or you you see it that way because you know you own a house or you don't own a house. So again, the the reasoning, even at the self aware level, is pretty concrete and pretty much pretty much affected still by conformity. And because we're going to talk about moving out of the self aware level now. Yeah, what you're speaking to. I mean, I experienced this firsthand in looking into 9-11, for one, from the conformity or conformist paradigm, you're not allowed to ask really uncomfortable questions that may rock the boat. That was the first thing. Then if I tried to share some of the mainstream articles that contradicted what other mainstream news articles in the government was stating, people would attack me personally they would say, oh, you are, you must be a liberal or you must be a Democrat because they saw it in terms of a political divide. It was interesting how people would project where they were onto me to yeah. try to make my questions go away or my perspective that didn't fit into their worldview irrelevant. So another way of doing that is you use a term, a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist, or some kind of pejorative term that says, really, you're defective in the way you're thinking, and I'm not going to allow your defect to infect my worldview. Right. Well, it's labeling you in a certain group, like you're a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist. You're not in my group. I And, you, you know, like you said, even if you present the evidence, the person says, well, you know, where are the whistleblowers um, doesn't recognize you are a whistleblower. I mean, the, so this this way of thinking that has to do with our stage of development is a paradigm that we cannot erase. It's in our ears and our eyes. It's in our assumptions. It's a logic, and that logic basically motivates us to sort out what we learn, whether we learn it from awakening, or we learn it from another person, or it just comes to us until it breaks through the logic of the stage that we're in. And so the, the logic of what's interesting, though, is on the outside group, which were, quote, the 9-11 is referred to as the truthers. What's interesting is their own level of conformity, where it becomes their goal or mission in life to wake other people up to the, quote, truth they have discovered. And now they're living within these tunnels of what they see. 
And what was interesting was as, you know, part of this was an existential crisis that I think contributed to me asking myself a lot of really serious questions about what's important, what my values are, what am I trying to do? Why am I doing this? Who am I? And when my friend and I, Janice, would ask other people, like, there's all this psychological resistance to trying to, quote, wake somebody up. It really is an inside job. You've got to do it yourself. You can't force anybody to see something they don't want to see. And apparently that perspective in itself is a post-conformist perspective of accepting yeah. the way others will view their reality and understanding yeah. that the rational mind is not, we're not rational. We're animals. We're irrational animals in many ways, but we believe we live in a very rational world or we can apply logic to everything. And then, you know, for example, somebody sees a video of something happening in free fall and you're an engineer or an architect and you know, steel can't just collapse because some part of a building burned 80 stories in the air. The base of the building was never weakened. And yet you can override that rational part of your mind by saying, well, we're, we're the whistleblowers. Where's this? Anything you can do to keep your worldview from shattering, the resistance to growing up is really powerful if somebody tries to push you there and you don't want to go. Yeah. I mean, well, it's powerful whether it's somebody or it happens to you that you push yourself there. It's uh, because it requires this change in your assumptions. And again, it isn't even so much. So rationality plays a role in all post-conformist stages. In other words, people are able to use inductive and deductive reasoning, which is at the root of rationality. People are able to make hypotheses and disconfirm their hypotheses. But those things might not be made at a co in a complex way. In a very superficial way, for example, a person might say, yeah, I know there are a lot of different beliefs about what happened in 9-11. And I know that there are people who think that this or that, but, you know, I've never been convinced that there's really enough evidence. But that person speaking that way is saying, is acknowledging there are differences. There can be other ways of thinking other than, say, what the U.S. government has said. But they're not open to a variety of ways because they're still fundamentally sorting things by groups. They're the these people and the those people and the those people. And these people do this and those people do that. So, you know, the movement away from sorting things by groups is this next stage that's coming into view, which is called, I think it's unfortunate, but it is called the conscientious stage of development in Jane Lovinger's ego development stages. She named it conscientious at the time that she discovered it because she really discovered it because of conscientious objectors to the Vietnam War because she saw that there were people who were willing to sacrifice their own money, their comfort, their family connections, because their values were individual values, and they were willing to go to prison rather than to go to the war. And she saw that the, the way that a conformist would reason about that was that that person was scared of fighting, and she saw that conformists could not speak to conscientious objectors because they didn't understand the logic of the conscientious objector. The conscientious objector was saying, my moral values prevent me from going to Vietnam and killing people there who are not fighting me. And the conscientious objector was saying, you can send me to jail for that. You can remove me from the country but I'm not going to do it. And so she named the stage conscientious because it was a person who was willing to go against the group and really not be rewarded by any kind of behavioral reward. Because at this point, behaviorism was very important in psychology. And the idea was that if you give, if you give people, you know, that extra gold coin, they'll do anything. And she was showing with this stage that, that in the normal unfoldment of adult development, 
there develops a point at which you can no longer reward that individual with material rewards and get that person to change as a result. And that is the conscientious stage. And I, I connect this to the work with personal causation with Richard de Charms also that there's also a shift from like extrinsic compliance, complying to the rules of the group and others' perceptions of me and beginning to go inwards and examining my own values and reasons for action. And I, I'm reminded of Rick Doblin of MAPS shared a story. He was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War. And his parents who were professionals said, you know, if you take this path, you will never be able to be a licensed professional. And so he wrestled with that and chose to object. It involves really looking at what you're going to give up. And as you're saying, there is no external reward for doing this. Society doesn't pat whistleblowers on the back and say thank you. You know, I, I think about the hundreds of uh, whistleblowers from the intelligence agencies, some of whom I got to interview and meet, and they've thrown away lifelong careers by standing up and speaking out from within a bureaucracy where you are not allowed to do that. And it's in many ways, they knew the choices they were making. What's the guy's name who's in Russia? Snowden. Snowden. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I think yeah. You know, yeah. He's a very good example. Is a yes. perfect example of this. Right. He went by his own values and principles. He believed, I mean, in essence, there is a conformist aspect of it because again, the stages are built on the foundation of the prior stages. So he believed in maybe this sense of our moral presence in the world. And then what he was seeing is that from the inside of the beast, those were not the values embodied by what the intelligence agency was doing. And so he knew what the consequences of that choice would be. And in my lifetime, you know, when I was growing up in the, in the eighties, you only heard about people defecting and coming to the United States. And it's interesting how the media is downplayed and vilified him for what he did. But the fact that that was the only place in the world that he could be safe is I think quite telling actually. Well, he's a really good example of conscientious thinking because the one thing that really stands out at this next stage is this moral responsibility that you take unique individual moral responsibility. You will make decisions for yourself and not in the framework of the group. And you're willing also to not be rewarded, in fact, to be uh, you know, ostracized and to be deprived. And so I just want to go through the, these uh, characteristics again, recognizing this is the beginning of deep nonconformity. So this is the first step. So we, you know, it's interesting because it will sound like it's the ultimate step. But when you go beyond this, you'll see there are still some very big differences and changes that adults make in changing their assumptions about what's real. But at this stage, there is a very strong sense of responsibility, particularly moral responsibility. The person has a differentiated and rich inner life, and they savor and appreciate their experiences. They're aware of the complexities of their own impulses and their desires to control. Their interpersonal relationships are complex and intensive. They see patterns in people's behaviors. They have a vivid sense of individual differences. They understand long-term dispositions or let's say, delayed gratification that are involved in behavior change. Their descriptions of people are much more realistic than at the conformist or the self-aware stage because they perceive people as being more complex. They're very aware of themselves. They reflect on themselves. They describe themselves in terms of others, and they can see their own intentions and motives as well as the consequences of their own behavior. They see life as presenting them with choices, and they understand that they hold to some extent the origin of their own destiny. And so they're concerned very much about their inner conflicts, the contradictions within themselves, the incongruities between their experience and what they want for themselves. And there is a very much of an increased understanding of personal meaning. So in all of these ways, this conscientious stage is a massive change from conformity. Unfortunately, 
this is the unfortunate part of it. And I feel we can see this somewhat in the generation of countercultural people. There can be uh, this cohort. There can be, again, a kind of regression to a conformity around moral superiority, feeling that they've arrived at the place where they know what's right and wrong. They know for every instance how you should be and how you should behave. They've sacrificed for their own principles, and they're not going to um, be quiet about that. And so the idea here, again, is that we, we, we at the conscientious stage, we know what the world is like, and we know what's right and what's wrong, and we take a position of superiority about that. And so thank you very much. We know how we're going to vote. We know which group is good. We've noticed that since the Vietnam War, we understand the mapping. And yes, there are a lot of individual differences, but that doesn't mean that all those differences could be morally supported. So that bit of a sense of moral superiority goes with conscientiousness and has produced in some ways an argument that I think can be invested with the, at least the smell of conformity you know, or the, the hint of conformity because it sounds as though we know, but you don't. And it, and it can go also with waking up. You know, we know how important it is to wake up to this internal unity, this reality of love. And so people who don't do that are just kind of normies and stupid. So again, you get this flavor of regression towards conformity around moral superiority. And this raises, I think, the issue of dealing with inner conflict differently as you move beyond conformity. Whereas in the conformist stage, it's easier to repress or push away any of these really uncomfortable thoughts or feelings that may rise in my awareness. And as I'm growing up, I'm beginning to develop the ability to sit in discomfort, in paradox, and not being able to maybe fully wrap my head around it but in essence, by being able to sit in that uncomfortable position and become more aware of what I'm thinking and feeling related to what's going on, I think this is a part of the process of developing understanding, empathy, compassion, and then the ability to sit with others as you grow up, as I grow up, who aren't at the same stage maybe or aren't dealing with these inner Maybe they don't resolve these inner conflicts. Maybe they're not aware of them. But to have the empathy to be in relationship without judgment and just right. to accept people where they are. And this, this is something that's, I find it's still challenging because I'm aware of the resistance and the discomfort that I feel within myself. And so in, in, in another way of looking at it, I can use that discomfort as a tool for raising my own awareness, because the thing that I'm probably resisting in you or someone else is really something I may not want to see about myself in my own shadow work. Well, in see, I would say at this conscientious stage also, shadow work is very appealing because people do believe that there's a contradiction that can be worked out, you know, like uh, that I can see what my darker side is, I can become aware of that. And then I will, you know, maybe no longer have such a darkness, or at least when it comes up, I can, you know, mediate it. So the idea even of shadow work, which is of course a Jungian idea, comes up at the conscientious stage. And in many ways, I'm going to say this big word instantiated. It's instantiated there. In other words, it's made kind of concrete and literal at the conscientious stage. So the, the real problem for the conscientious stage and, eas and easily also is the regression at later stages, back to this stage, is that moral judgment, is the idea that there's a strong right and wrong. And when I do things that when I project my shadow onto others, it's because I'm disavowing my shadow. It's because I don't know 
what it is in myself that is my own overweening pride or my own stupid aggressions or whatever. So again, the idea is a little too formulaic. It's too pristine because that isn't the way the world works. But it's always, it's always when you get beyond conformity, it's always tempting to feel morally superior and to feel like, you know, you've got the number now, you know what it is, and you, by God, are going to get recognized for that. And um, so I, I think, again, this, this kind of conversation can come into any conversation about waking up, particularly around taking psychedelic substances, but also uh, around waking up through meditation, perhaps also in the NDE conversations. I don't have that many NDE conversations, but the the idea here is that everybody should have this experience. This is the best experience. And I am going to make sure as much as possible that I get the word out there that this is the way you should do it. This is the way to do it. So, you know, that that strong moral responsibility is kind of like infected <laughs> with a feeling of superiority and then an identification with your group. The big transition at this stage is huge, and it is towards the recognition that the individual is responsible, and it's not the group, and that you can't blame the group, you can't blame your family, you can't blame the Republicans, you can't blame the Democrats, and there's a lot of that going on all the time. But you know, at a true conscientious stage, you realize that your own self-responsibility is hard enough to embrace, and so other people also can't really live up to their values and live up to their ideals because you know you can't you know but then once you once you see that you tend to think well that's the right way that yeah. opens into the notion once i can accept those irreconcilable differences and contradictions and inconsistencies within myself i guess from one perspective i see that if i can do that and i can see that in myself then I may have the ability to work with what arises to develop equanimity with it. Yes. And then once I get there, I can then begin to try to apply it in my relationships with others. If I can sit with and be comfortable with my own, I'll call it paradox, right? Of my own inconsistencies where I catch myself contradicting myself, my own, irrecon my own inability to reconcile what comes up within myself I can now acknowledge that, well, how can I judge you if, if I'm not judging myself for it? Now it opens up the possibility for connection and dialogue with others because that empathy can lead to connection and that it's yeah. about understanding and accepting. If I'm accepting it within myself, now I have the opportunity to accept it in others and to go deeper. And that in in sitting in that discomfort, in the awareness of these challenging paradoxes, that's the journey to making better decisions, to growing up, to moving forward, I guess, in a way. It is a path of transformation. It can be used as a tool of transformation then to grow more. Well, yes, although to some extent, some of the logic of what you're saying is conscientious rather than post-conscientious. Um, because sometimes it can't be used for any better development, just the recognition of this tremendous incompatibility of different kinds of polar opposites in humans and in our experiences. So for example, I wanted to bring up the climate change conversations at this point, because I think most of the most of the conversations that are organized around climate justice and climate change are organized at the conscientious level. And so there's there's no room for any conversation that says, well, hey, maybe things are more complex than the terms that are being set up here. Uh, because as soon as that's stated, the idea is, oh, you're against this. So again, the idea at the conscientious stage is there's there's moral righteousness. And when it comes to climate change and climate justice, you know, this is sort of the new religion. I mean, there's moral righteousness. And really, the idea here right now is that we did not do it right. And so we're self, we're going to be suffering hell and damnation here on earth because we didn't we didn't reduce the carbon. And so now we're suffering. Uh, there's no there's no understanding in that argument that 
we may not know what's happening here on Earth. That the complexity of climate, even trying to predict weather for a couple of days, is really beyond our ability to understand it. So to blame humans for what's going on right now is a conscientious position. It's the idea that you know what happened and what happened was immoral, that we didn't really fulfill the climate treaties, et cetera. So now I'm speaking like the next level, which is the level that's called individualistic, which is again, a massive shift developmentally. What, what were you gonna say there? Well, I, I was gonna say that that shift to individualistic from that perspective, I can see my own contribution to some of these greater issues and from the realization that maybe I can change my own behavior, I might make the choice to have a minimalist lifestyle. I don't have to preach it to other people because the only thing I can do is work on my own contribution to what I perceive to be the problem. At the same time, though, I can then look at the mass culture and see troubling aspects of the, of the consumer-driven lifestyle where things are about consumption and profit. You know, which also goes back to uh, to raise a question about post-conformists tend to or may, be, may gravitate towards um, unconventional career paths. So in other words, you can hear the conversation with somebody who goes in to study climate and their parents might say, you know, did I, did I put you through college so you could go get a job where you won't be able to support yourself? Whereas from the perspective of the post-conformist, I'm following a path, a career path that aligns with my values. My my values, you know, like the conscientious um, objector, what I do, I want to make a contribution. It isn't about self gratification. And but if you're stuck, house. if you're if you're stuck at the conscientious stage, you're stuck with a feeling of moral superiority about that. That you're doing it the right way. You have the small house. You're the non consumer. This is the right way. And even if you don't preach it. You don't have a complex sense of all of the contradictions that are involved in a life in which you can choose to have a smaller footprint because you're so well educated that you even understand what that means versus somebody else's life where they might become a big consumer. They might, they might do all sorts of, let's say, environmentally risky things but their heart is good and they just haven't yet met the idea of a minimalist lifestyle because again at this conscientious stage there's the sense that you know what the truth is at the next stage the individualistic stage there's a deep embrace of paradox and the recognition that truth always has a quasi contradictory nature in itself there's no forced choice there's no two possible columns, the right and the wrong. And so increasingly at this next stage, there's a facing of the contradictions and the incongruities in all our experiences. And the individual becomes aware of a greater complexity in conceiving of interpersonal relationships. The idea of communication, the expression of feelings is deepened and made more complex. Psychological causality replaces vague statements about reasons and morals and problems that are given at lower levels. And the subject gives vivid and personal versions of ideas that were presented at cliches at earlier, as, as cliches at earlier levels. And so there's the understanding that the outward appearances of reality, the way people perceive things, that they're misleading and that you can't really, you can't really let's say, see the bigger picture. You don't have a God's eye view of what exactly is right and what is exactly wrong. You have responsibility for your own actions and you have the freedom to act according to your own responsibility and your sense of what's right and wrong. You've established that at the conscientious level, but you no longer feel the sense of moral superiority. Even at a felt level, you realize that there are many causes and conditions to what got you to where you are and that you don't necessarily see the goodness or the badness of what someone else is doing in a way that is really congruent with the reality. 
you can only see things from your own perspective. So this change is the one that Ken Wilber and I have talked about, the change from conscientious to individualistic. And the importance of it is the issue that we're facing right now, which is this polarization between sides. So, you know, in in our society, there's a strong polarization about the right and the wrong, the good and the bad. And some of it is at the conformist level and some is at the conscientious level. But to transcend that conscientious level and really you start to be much more honest about what you don't know and how you can't see the bigger picture. At the same time, you take a stand about what your own morals and principles are. Um, that is actually this individualistic level. And um, there, there are no rewards for this socially. There are just no rewards. For not, only, not only are there no rewards, um, I, I will ask myself, what difference does it make to make these choices? And I'm going to live in that paradox. It's what I believe I can do. But I know that if I'm the only one doing it, it's really kind of meaningless. And then there's, you know, layers and levels to how far you want to go in terms of the larger picture of what we're talking about in essence is about what is self. Where is that boundary between what's inside and outside? So in essence, I'm playing this really complicated, strange game with myself. I'm, for example, I might choose a minimalist lifestyle. It isn't about feeling better than other people. It's about trying to connect my behavior with my values and to live it in an authentic way. And from the conformist or conscientious perspective, that probably appears from the outside to be pretty strange. It could even appear to be uncaring because maybe uh, I'm perceived I don't care about material comfort. It's certainly unconventional. And at the same time, another example would be I love sushi. I love tuna. I'm also aware that if every person has access to eating tuna, tuna cannot be uh, farmed. There will not be tuna left. And right, yet, right. I like tuna. I have to make a choice. Am I going to eat tuna? If I choose to forego eating tuna, I'm also aware there are plenty of other people who are going to go out and eat tuna. Well, the, the thing that maybe you're kind of getting at that really is the reward for becoming individualistic is the zest for life that you no longer are haunting yourself with all this sort of moral haunt, let's say. It's not that you've lost your values or your morals, but the desire to truly be alive and be yourself is well known to you so that you feel this sort of freedom from conformity and from materialistic standards that you previously felt trapped by you also feel this deepened sense of being able to be honest with yourself and objective about what you're doing. And that allows you to live more fully aligned with your own desires and principles. And what happens is that you become less, less disgruntled and less dissatisfied and less complaining. And you're more open to empathy, curiosity, and so on, because you see that the choices that you make in your life are are hinged around on all sorts of things that you didn't design. You know, the education you got, where you were born, what kind of body you have, all of that you see everybody is dealing with that. And so, you know, there may be somebody over there, you know, really doing a terrible job of recycling and then also gambling out in, uh, well, I mean, he, actually, I'll give you a better story. Mark Uno told me this story. You know, he had a carpenter who was a Republican Trump supporter, and he was working back and forth with this guy. And uh, the guy would be listening to Bill Riley uh, and would need to finish listening before he could come out to do the work for, for Mark. And Mark Uno is a Buddhist teacher and so on. And, but he found this guy to be really engaging emotionally engaging and forthright and a very good worker. Eventually, he found out that this man was supporting 15 people in the community, some of whom were living in trailers in his backyard, who were homeless. Kids, he was helping them get through life. He was helping people, families around him. He was doing all this without ever mentioning it to anybody. And so 
on one hand, yeah, he was interested in Bill Riley and he'd voted for Trump. But on the other hand, he was doing so much good. Like there was no way to put him in a category. You just, he couldn't be categorized. And so that fits very much with this new frame of reference that this individualistic person is developing, that the world is more complex than can ever be sum summarized in these moral principles. And you, and you really, really should not divide things up into the good guys and the bad guys or the ones who know and the ones who don't know. There should be no basket of deplorables. That's a waste of time. No us and them. No us and them. In, and in, in embracing that ambiguity of not knowing, of being comfortable living in the question and not having the answers. And I just wanted to add that in speaking about that, being honest with oneself, it opens up the possibility to move beyond reactivity and to be able to choose how to respond instead of putting somebody in a box or a category based on what I may perceive to be their political leanings. I think I may fill in the picture of who this person is. They don't have compassion, let's say. You know, that might be what I'm projecting onto a conservative who listens to Bill O'Reilly. And yet I won't be able to see the rest of who this person is if I'm living in that very narrow black and white reality. And then as he unfolds or as the person unfolds in their humanness, it gets much more complicated. You know, the notion that he's he's following or admiring or listening to these ideas, and yet that would contradict what I hear he is doing in his own life to help others through empathy and compassion. Well, you're you're bringing up something that does get integrated at the final stage. Now, I know there's a stage that research have taken, researchers have taken beyond. Jane's final stage is called integrated. And I understand there's another stage called flow, which I haven't, I don't understand the, you know, what the research has established for that stage. But at the integrated stage, there is a recognition that when you listen to Bill O'Reilly, I realized I called it Bill Riley because I've never listened, but when, when, when you or I listen to Bill O'Reilly, we're not listening through the ears of this other person. So we cannot tell what he is hearing in Bill O'Reilly. He may be inspired in a way that leads him directly to care for the homeless people. He may be inspired in a way that leads him to give more of his money to helping others than anybody does who has a lot of investments and assets. This man had no investments or assets. He was using all of his money to help others. So evaluating somebody by your own eyes and ears, what you hear in Bill O'Reilly, what you hear when you turn on Fox News, what you hear when you, I don't know, listen to Trump, you know, I would add, I, or you listen to the Democrats or MSNBC or, you listen to the Democrats? or the left-leaning media. Right. That none of those things apply to the other. But you start to realize that your individuality is so important to how you experience things. And with the idea that there's, a, you know, it's really kind of a settling out of the previous level into bigger categories that, you know, we are all you know, enclosed in our own snow globes, and we are individuals. And our concern at this last level or the, the final levels, the concern is to convey the importance of respecting people's identities, their individuality, and the complexity of traits. And also with that comes a zest for life, a love for all of humanity, a recognition of that you don't know feelings of you know awe and uncertainty coming more often than those experiences of knowing the right way and making moral judgments i thought i'd read a couple of statements from the sentence completions of people who are at this final stage on the the stem or the theme the thing i like about myself here are just a couple of of examples the thing i like about myself is my ability to love without losing my identity, question mark. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you see the different sides to it. Yeah, the thing I, I, I feel I can love without losing my identity. And then a question mark. Oh, yeah. And another question mark. 
the thing I like about myself is my ability to organize in what I hope is genuine humility and a basic compassion for all people. The thing I like about myself is that, like most people, I like to do many different things. I find many things in life that are humorous, as well as serious, and I believe in God. The thing I like about myself is my sensitivity to the world around me, to people's feelings, and my sense of humor. The thing I like about myself is that I like all humanity. I'm glad to be one of them. The thing I like about myself is my abilities to face the actualities, sometimes pleasant, often not, about life and myself. And so you sort of see, again, in a one sentence you know, response to that stem, the thing I like about myself, and of course there are 36 in any of these protocols, when we're reading from this scoring manual, we know that's been well established that that protocol is at that level. So at this, this final level is this, this very complex set of um, differentiation of different individuals, a high tolerance for ambiguity, a tolerance for conflicting alternatives that are construed as aspects of a many faceted life rather than as these sides of opposites or a paradox. The person is also really desires to communicate these complex thoughts and feelings. These emotion, their emotions are vividly differentiated. Their sensual experiences come through their love, their open-heartedness, spontaneity, genuineness, and intensity. So at that stage, though, you can see that it's hard to belong to the Democrats or the Republicans. It's hard to say exactly where you stand because you don't any longer believe that you have this big picture of how things should be. It's more like you know something about yourself, you know, and you understand what you want in your life. You have a zest for it, you're, but you're not a relativist either. It's not like you're saying, well, anything goes here. It's more like the purpose and meaning of life are very important for every individual, and it's important to follow a moral path, and it's important to align, but people might be doing that, and you don't know that they are because you can't see them clearly because you only see your own way. So I don't know if the flow stage is the ability to roll with the punches and kind of flow through life, but I can imagine that this integrated sense of self integrated with a world that is complex might lead to an ability to roll, you know, with the suffering, with the impermanence, with the sense of not being able to control things. My sense of the flow state in the work of Chicks and Haley about when you're in a state of flow, you're not within your default mode network or your ego, and you're in essence in a state of oneness with whatever arises to bring equanimity into it. And so if I've developed a sense of purpose or personal mission, let's say, in flow, I know that I'm waiting for whatever to arise. I'm not going to push or pull or try to force. It doesn't mean that I don't try to do in the world. I still try to do, but I'm also comfortable. I, I guess another way I, I would put it this way, rather than looking for feedback or expectations from other people, in a way I would call it looking for universal feedback. So doors open when I'm not invested in an outcome of what I think something should look like, how I'm going to move forward in my life. In essence, there are times where I do wait to see, for example, I'll follow synchronicities that arise in my life. I look at that as universal feedback. To me, it's more valuable at times than human feedback because something happens that I experience as something deeply significant and meaningful for me subjectively that nobody else could make any sense out of or begin to comprehend. And I think this goes back to some of the STEM answers. You're talking about these profound ways of looking at and understanding or make, trying to make sense of, of existence and of our interconnectedness, and that those insights can be really difficult for others to grasp, and it can result in feeling really isolated or morally superior as a way to kind of protect yourself from that isolation perhaps it's a possible response. well that i would that would definitely be a regression back to yes. conscientiousness and i i honestly think from my knowledge of 
at least hanging around with the people that were around Jane. And then over time, I've met some people that I think function at this stage. What typically happens is a greater sense of humor rather than moral superiority. There's an ability to make fun of oneself and also just see the humor in life, the way things happen. And to appreciate that, you know, like you were saying, you can look to the bigger kinds of patterns around you that look like synchronicity. You can also just look at when doors open, you can go through them. When they're closed, you can't. And it's just a kind of straightforward understanding of what's happening rather than seeing that your control or your perspective or your judgment or whatever is so important. You know? And I like, I like the, so what I hear, what I'm hearing you say in essence is it's, I'm not taking myself so seriously. Um, I'm not identifying with what arises. I'm witnessing it. I'm going with the flow of what arises without necessarily judging it, getting stuck in it, identifying with it. And being able to laugh at all of these yes. like absurd kinds of things that human beings are wrestling with and are always, you know, it's as though humans are, again, because of the conformity, because of the conscientiousness, they're, they're always and forever, it seems, coming up with ways to fault themselves, to judge themselves, to put themselves into a kind of a hell realm because they haven't done something right or to put someone else in because they didn't do it right. You know, that you can have a sense of humor about that. Um, and I, and I love the choice of the word absurd because at times from this perspective, things really do take on this humorous, absurd quality when yeah. I see how many of my problems only exist in my own head and I keep recreating them and dragging them along with me. You can see that though, in waking up, I mean, just to bring this back because we're just about done here, yes. I think. In waking up, so, you know, you have this ontological shock, however it is that you got there, whether it happens to you, whether you do something, when you bring that back to your paradigm, to your frame of reference, you could be bringing back more reason to judge others. You could be bringing back more reason to judge yourself. You could be bringing back anxiety about getting there again to that sort of, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, everything is together and I feel so much love. Or if you're waking up in these deeper non-conformist stages, you bring it back as another complexity. This is a view into how can, how can we as humans bring this sense of love and unity and oneness into our lives in a way that doesn't harm us further, that doesn't make us more judgmental of the people around us, and that doesn't drive us further into stereotypes or repetitive conflict or, you know, just not being able to listen to the other guy. So, you know, where you wake up, what stage of development you are in, you're going to be bringing it back there. And it is a good idea to try to understand your logic, to try to understand what is the kind of thing you're finding when you find yourself in an awakened state, it's going to typically be a much better state than what you're usually walking around in, unless you know, you're know you in a near-death experience because you tried to commit suicide, frankly, which is not going to be a good thing. And I'm sure there are other things in psychedelics where it's not. But in general, the waking up Okay, you're 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 noticing something. You're getting something. It's you're feeling it. Now, when you bring it back, what are you going to do with it? And you know that's that's a really really different way of looking at waking up and knowing that you can't force a stage change in your development. You can't force the river. You can't force the natural conditions of your own individuality. You know you you can begin to see it more clearly. As you see it more clearly, especially if you're at a conformist stage and you suddenly say, well, what about death? You know, you might notice that everybody stops. And at that point, you might be able to bring about a change from waking up just at that stage, because that stage is still so captured by the group. You know, so, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say the bigger picture here as we move on will be to look at the implications of these different stages. And then how does waking up look at each one of these stages? I, I think we'll be in 
that conversation too. So to summarize and close out this episode, we've talked about navigating this post-conformist and later stages of ego development and how this involves embracing a level of insight and wisdom that may not be easily shared or understood by those in earlier stages, and that it can lead to a sense of isolation and non-witnessing as individuals find themselves operating in a realm of understanding that's less common. However, this journey also brings profound personal growth, authenticity, and the potential to inspire positive change in society. And while the path might be challenging, those who embrace it often contribute to a broader shift in consciousness and the evolution of our collective understanding. So as we conclude this episode, we invite you to ponder the multifaceted nature of post-conformity and deep non-conformity. Thank you for tuning into another thought-provoking conversation. Please subscribe, share, and engage with us in the comments sections. We really do want to hear your thoughts and invite you to share your insights with us. You're a vital part of the journey, and I would like to thank you for tuning in. And thank you, Polly. Thank you, too, Michael. This was great. I enjoy it, too. Enjoyed this episode of Waking Up Is Not Enough, Flourishing in the Human Space? Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and tap the notification bell so you never miss an episode of insightful discussions and explorations into the human psyche. Share this episode with friends and family to spread the journey of self-awareness and critical thinking. Together, Let's challenge the norms, embrace empathy, and flourish in our unique paths. Your support means the world to us and our growing community. Share your comments in the thoughts below. We love hearing from you. Please take a moment right now to go to realdialogue.com and join our membership community. For a short time, we're offering annual and lifetime membership in the Real Dialogue community at a very limited cost. There you have access to countless hours of teachings, interviews, conversations with Polly, Mike, and prominent scientists, sages, and seekers who share your interests in waking up and flourishing. Again, go to realdialogue.com, join in a live conversation with Polly and Mike through your membership. The second Tuesday of each month, we have an AMA that we do together. As always, we really look forward to meeting you and to hearing your perspective. Please like and share the podcast with friends and family. If you know of people who you think would benefit from this conversation and would like to take part in our monthly AMAs, consider sharing this with family and friends and consider giving them the gift of membership in our community. This podcast was produced and edited by Chris Coltrane and is part of the Center for Real Dialogue. It is available on all major podcast channels for free. Thank you for listening.